Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hello everyone. Although plenty of the peptides we've discussed have blatant overlapping features that we've touched on, I think that by evaluating some of the structural similarities between them, it's helpful in seeing how truly similar some or most of them are. And this is especially clear when we look at the big GHRH analogs like Sermorolin, CJC1295, and modified GRF. So the purpose of this video is to clear up the confusion in the same way that the last hopefully helped you all understand and the oftentimes misconceived differences between TB4 and TB500. So for this video, we're going to touch on the subtle structural differences amongst these popular peptides, because although dissecting the research unique to each is critical in our understanding, from a more generalized standpoint, many are in fact quite similar, like fraternal twins in a way, or triplets, or quadruplets. And although I often talk about how crummy it is to give blanket statements about peptides, typically in regards to their purported out Outcomes, I think there is benefit in categorical understanding in addition to the more intricate details among them. And I'll spare you the details we've rehashed a million times. So by this point, we're familiar with the growth hormone releasing hormone axis, and as such, we acknowledge that peptides interact at different parts, albeit our understanding of some mechanisms are better than those of others, but regardless, I'll try my hand at some graphics so we can understand the key features. So for this video, we're going to start with the GHRH growth hormone release releasing hormone mimetics, or the compounds that are shaped like growth hormone releasing hormone in a way and act like the hormone itself. The popular ones in this category are sermorolin, CJC1295, with and without its drug affinity complex, modified GRF, and tesamorolin. Now GHRH itself is comprised of 44 amino acids, and as is popular with the peptide game, this structure is manipulated to recreate its activity at the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor at the pituitary. At the same time, popularly, growth hormone releasing hormone is also known as GRF, or growth hormone releasing factor. And one of the tough things about this space are the myriad of terms used interchangeably, so it's worth knowing that a lot of these terms do indeed mean the same thing. And if these peptides are so similar, why are they worth differentiating? That's because there are not only pharmacokinetic differences amongst them, most typically variations in half-life that are pertinent, but also dissecting their individual research can allow us to most appropriately assess peptide-specific indications and possible adverse effects. Although, as we highlighted a million times, there is most likely significant overlap. And just to touch back briefly on what I just said, half-life is important for a couple reasons, right? One of these reasons is knowing approximately how long a drug or an active compound will be circulating, but also something pretty significant with pharmacology in general is that the longer the half-life, the longer a person would be subject to certain adverse effects. So we'll spend the rest of this video going into a little handy-dandy chart I made which will be available for download on the Patreon. Before we go any further, if you haven't already and you enjoy peptide content based off legitimate research without the fluff and frequent assertions based on nothing that they will 100% work or fail for you, please give us a like and subscribe. It's a relatively small space, and I've truly enjoyed making these videos and hearing all of your input. Thanks in advance. On top of that, if you do want to hear more details on differentiating between these peptides, I can say with confidence we've got amongst the most in-depth analyses of videos assessing their research and clinical paths. So type in your peptide of interest on my channel's page or search through the playlist. You'll find everything about Sermorolin, CJC, with versus without the drug affinity complex, all of its clinical trials and tribulations, everything about tesamorolin from research indicated adverse effects to the details of its development, and even more. So let's talk about that chart. So if we take a look at endogenous growth hormone releasing hormone, you can see that it has 44 amino acids and has an endogenous circulating half-life of approximately 7 minutes. And now by looking at the other similar compounds that are essentially based off growth hormone releasing hormone or GRF, you'll see that they're slightly modified. So sermorolin is GHRH 1 through 29, also known as GRF 1 through 29, and as is pretty obvious, it consists of 29 amino acids. So these are the 29 amino acids that comprise the first 29 of the structure of endogenously produced growth hormone releasing hormone, and as a half-life that's pretty short but longer than that of endogenously produced GRF, approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Modified GRF, 
and CJC-1295 without DAC are very structurally similar to Samorolin, so mod GRF, as the name suggests, is modified and has an amino acid difference of 4, and CJC without DAC, or drug affinity complex that significantly prolongs the half-life of the compound, has a 3 amino acid difference. You can pause here, try to discern the differences if you would like, but they are subtle and minimal. So these differences are essentially made because there's one feature that we can pretty much control for, and that could be the half-life. And although these are not well studied by any means, modified GRF has a proposed half-life that's about double that of Samorolin, and CJC-1295 without DAC is unclear, likely within the range of 10 to 30 minutes. I imagine pretty similar to mod GRF or Samorolin, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't make a huge difference. Where the difference lies is if we look at CJC-1295 with DAC or DAC or the drug affinity complex, whatever you want to call it, it prolongs the half-life significantly to about six to eight days. It has the same three amino acid substitutions as does CJC-1295 without DAC, but there's also an added lysine molecule that helps to serve the linkage to the drug affinity complex. Finally, so as we come full circle here, we can see that tessamorolin does have the same 44 amino acids as endogenously produced growth hormone releasing hormone with an added hexanoia moiety that is isn't too important in this case. We do see that the half-life is different based on the patient population, so we know that Tessamorolin, branded as Egrifta, is FDA approved for management of HIV-associated lipodystrophy, and so it was evaluated in not just those with HIV, but also otherwise healthy people. And in the otherwise healthy, it exhibits a half-life of about 26 minutes, while those with HIV exhibit a half-life of about 38 minutes. So I hope this video really helped differentiate between some of the structural components that show how similar these peptides are, but for the sake of this channel and understanding in general, it's helpful to really look at these differences, and this is just one part of it. So I hope you found it educational, informative, not too boring, maybe for once. I'll make sure to throw the pertinent videos and playlists into the description below, as will be the Patreon if you're looking for a way to further support the channel, have access to video requests, more regularly regularly, stuff like that. Regardless, if you haven't already, just hit that like and subscribe button. Much appreciated as always. And finally, I hope that you have a great day. Thank you very much for watching. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy.